You see, the doctors, the female society, they don't even care because we have no friends. The fathers, the monsters, we let them move. But now, all we have to do is make a picture. So, Darcy! Darcy, Darcy, Catherine, Darcy, Catherine, that's at Catherine Darcy on the website you all know as Twitter.com. She's funny and instructive in a good way and just a lovely Twitter follow. So please go give at Catherine Darcy at C-A-T-H-E-R-I-N-E-D-A-R-C-I a follow. Uh, that's her at username thingy. And she rules. I had another Twitter friend uh, all lined up and ready to call out, which, again, I'm going to need everyone I've called out to meet me at the K&K so we can wrestle. That was the uh, fight spot when I was in high school, the K&K. Convenience store, bait shop, gas station. You could really do it all at the K&K. Thank you so very much, so very kindly and muchly for joining me this week for a fantastical edition of the edgiest political podcast out there. Um, my name is Haas Bossman, and you're listening to Bread Sheet. That's right. I'm Hoss Bossman. This is Breadsheet, and today's guest is the unbelievably awesome Rachel Quirky Shank. We spake for about two hours, so this is a two-parter, and part one is the part you're about to hear. I am happy to report that every single second of this chat is mandatory for you to listen to if you want to go to heaven. Uh, so stay tuned for that, and don't forget to follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Twitch at Haas underscore Bossman. Also, check me a buck, or several bucks, at Patreon.com slash Haas underscore Bossman, and other stuff. Oh, I just released the very first Breadsheet album, The Sounds of Breadsheet. It's available at HaasBossman.Bandcamp.com. No underscores in that one, but yeah, I'm doing a, a fundraiser so I can buy Crimbus gifts for the wonderful people in my life whom I love and who love me. I'm pretty sure. Uh, so go visit hossbossman.bandcamp.com and grab yourself a copy of Sounds of Breadsheet. 29 tracks, all the music you know and love from this lovely podcast, plus a couple bonuses, all for a mere $7. And you can't really beat that. It's 29 tracks, but all of them are like a minute or less, mostly. Some of them are like three or four minutes long. But you, you can also pay more than $7 if you're in a giving mood, which you should be because Christmas. And that would, of course, be much appreciated. It is a lot of fun. Features the theme music you know and love from this show, as well as the uh, original breadsheet themes of Chris Crofton, David Griscom, uh, Jordan Holmes, Christy Amaguchi Maine, Investigate Joe Rogan, with other fun clips and even some like Alex Jones stuff and other goofy people synced up with uh, this all made from scratch original music I made for them, uh, for my guests my beloved breadsheet guests, and hossbossman.bandcamp.com. Going to that web address will allow you to purchase Sounds of Breadsheet. And, uh, oh, make sure to review and rate this podcast, share it with your friends. That was a little Haas news, the new album. And uh, here is even more Haas news. I have posted another new video on my YouTube channel at bit.ly slash HaasTube. That's from my conversation with the great Ben Burgess, talking about Joe Rogan and how the left should regard him, all that schnoz. Seems like every time I 
say something publicly on Twitter or on the show or in a YouTube video or whatever about how, you know, Joe Rogan's not that bad and he's got a huge platform and he lets, you know, very progressive leftist folks go on there and spew our message. So we should be willing to accept that big platform, if nothing else. Seems like every time I, you know, tacitly defend him or sort of, uh, you know, do some light apologism for Joe Rogan and his show, uh, he does something else messed up. Most recently, he uh, went on Alex Jones for four hours. Both of them got real fucked up on some, I don't know if they were on smoking, smoking weed or drunk or something, but yeah, he's, uh, you know, just legitimizes Alex Jones, who is pretty much a monster who only deserves ridicule. And even then, you know, it's questionable if he deserves the attention at all, even if it's negative attention. But in any case, Ben Burgess has a fantastic nuanced take on the question of should the left pay any attention to Joe Rogan or should we, you know, just completely hate him. But I, I highly recommend that video, uh, Chewing the Cud with Haas Bossman, who is me. And also, by the time you hear this, I will probably have posted another edition of Chewing the Cud. Um, and that's going to be one of the David Griscom clips. We're talking about country music is not it's not the right wing conservative. It's not theirs to own. Um, it's working man's music and working men should be on the left. I'll talk a little bit more about that on the next episode. All right. I want to start today's very special show with all that out of the way, which again consists of part one of my amazing chat with the Rachel Quirky Shank uh, by doing a little social talk. Okay, let's, let's call this the this segment we're going to call the Twitter Skinny. Here's my uh, famous theme song for that. I already did the thing last week where I, I think, where I like sang a song, uh, improv something, but let's see here. Um, it's the Twitter skinny baby down. Twitter skinny baby y'all. Twitter skinny get it down. Twitter skinny honey bun. Maybe there was something in there. Um, Welcome to the Twitter Skinny with Haas Bossman. That'll be a fun graphic to make if I ever pull a clip from this. Maybe I'll talk about Facebook on this segment sometimes, because I know some uh, some real ding-dongs on Facebook who I have some interactions with sometimes, which I think are sometimes kind of productive. Productive ding-dong interactions. Um, but this one is with an interaction with a non-ding-dong, with a wonderful spirit in this world. And actually today I was going to read some insane shit a ding dong said on Facebook and talk about how I approached responding to him. I think I did a decent job of not being too condescending. I'm trying to foster good communication with folks who might see themselves as being culturally on the right, but whose economic interests obviously line up with uh, the left or what they should see as lining up with the left. Anyway, I'll, I'll also save that for next week. Because of Darcy Catherine, the person I called out at the beginning. She's a wonderful tweeter with whom I recently connected who helped set me straight after I made a very insensitive joke. Heavy air quotes on that because I meant it as a joke, but looking at it now, it wasn't even really funny, like, at all. Suffice it to say, I said something along the lines of, I should watch Shia LaBeouf's good movies before the allegations against him are confirmed. And if you don't know, the artist uh, FKA Twigs, I think I'm remembering that name correctly, uh, recently brought a lawsuit against Shia for sexual assault and some other disturbing, very horrific allegations. I know the little joke I made doesn't seem that bad, especially if you're someone who's privileged enough to view issues like this as an outsider, as I am, but it was at best in poor taste for me to make a flippant remark about a sexual assault allegation. But. Darcy, a Twitter friend, was kind enough to point this out to me and bring up the very real issue of assault being taken not as seriously in our society when it comes from women of color than when it comes from white women. And of course, as we've learned over the past few years, for way too long, it seems like forever, uh, sexual assault allegations from women have not really been taken seriously in general. Probably sexual assault allegations from men, too. But uh, it's even worse when it comes to women of color. Uh, but we just had a we had a bit of a private back and forth, me and Darcy, but I'll just include the stuff we posted publicly here. Not that there was anything juicy in the DMs, nothing like private, uh, but, you know, just to keep it all above board, just keeping it 100, as we always do on Bridge. 
Okay, so just going to read a couple of these back and forth. So I'm not, I know it can be kind of annoying when people recount their social media interactions, which is exactly what I'm about to do here, but I'll try to, you know, make it quick. And I think it's important stuff, and I think you guys will be interested to hear this. So, at Catherine Darcy responded to my stupid joke with this at first. In before people humanize him because he she is not a white girl. Then this immediately afterward. Okay, actually, no. Not just going to make a glib remark and get choked up for Hallie for FKA Twigs for Megan. This is a bad joke. I'm sorry, but don't make her the secondary character in her own f***ing nightmare for your laughs. Which, you know, ouch. But warranted. So... Then we exchanged these words. I said, yeah, definitely not well advised for me to make a flippant remark, especially before reading how f***ing horrific the allegations are. Very insensitive, and if anyone deserves to have criminal charges brought against him, he does, no matter how remorseful he is. So then Darcy said, thanks for walking it back, man. I'm not mad, I'm just tired. Rihanna is a fucking goddess, and she was reduced to a bunch of edgy jokes in her darkest hour. It's insidious and it's real. Black women's pain is spectacle and fodder. And when women of color see the bravery of black women in the spotlight transmuted into jokes, they are less likely to come forward. Worse, they are less likely to self-validate their experience. I'm sorry to hijack, but this has impacted me and I desire a moment to teach. Thanks. Now, me, which I retweeted one of these. I made sure it was okay with her first, but uh, one of her comments, I said, Thanks, Catherine Darcy, for setting me straight. Uh, ignorance and privilege are no excuse for insensitivity, but hey, if my looking slash feeling like an asshole presents a good teaching opportunity, just read Darcy's comments. She says it better than I ever could. We seem to take for granted the fact that people of color get harsher punishments for the same crimes white people do, but it's even more disturbing to me that people who abuse or murder white people are more likely to get the death penalty than those who do the same to people of color. I'm firmly against the death penalty for anyone, but this discrepancy just says a lot about the systemic racism in our justice system and larger culture, in my opinion. Uh, even though it kind of made me look a fool, I, uh, you know, I think this was a very productive and good thing that we were all kind of talking about this pretty openly. Something it made me think about was how uh, it really kind of puts the lie to the whole cancel culture thing. I've expressed criticisms of cancel culture on this uh, show before, and you know, other places. And uh, I think there are uh, things to criticize. I think it can go too far. Also can be a bad look for the left. But also in my experience, well, here, I'll just uh, read what I what I said here. Yeah. And how accepting people tend to be of your apology, as long as it's sincere, really throws a wrench in the whole white, straight male victim narrative. People go on Joe Rogan and the like to perpetuate. I've accidentally misgendered people, said sexist shit, even accidentally played into anti-Semitic tropes, which is easier to unwittingly do than you might think, both online and in real life. And guess what? I've never been quote-unquote canceled. People are mostly reasonable, and as long as they know you're trying to see things from their perspective and be better, they usually welcome your allyship. So I bring all this up uh, not to show everybody how woke I am and uh which you know I, I guess I am virtue signaling to an extent because you know I kind of feel good about how this interaction went but really I bring it all up to present an example of what I think was a good exchange that all parties handled well except me with my initial bad tweet and when the dust settled I was a slightly more aware person Darcy Catherine had had an opportunity to teach and I to learn, and everyone looking on had a chance to see what that looks like. Being an internet weirdo, I'd really love to be able to foster more stuff like that. So that's why I'm sharing it with y'all, machine heads. Women, people of color, LGBTQ folks, I can't remember who said this, but I heard it recently, so tell me on the website, twitter.com, if you know where this take comes from. Um, something like, it's not your responsibility to educate white people, but if you don't do it, Prager you will. And that's all I'll say on this for today. Darcy has actually agreed to come on the show and talk more about this stuff, so that's awesome. We already had a blossoming virtual friendship on the Twitters, but now, not to be weird about it, but we were both, you know, vulnerable enough to actually connect with each other as fellow human beings, and that's a beautiful thing. Marianne Williamson, 2024, moral revolution, love revolution, okay, my big fat mouth has oozed brain thoughts for long enough. Let's start revving up for this Rachel Quirky Shank interview. 
Uh, help me out by visiting bit.ly slash call Haas and leaving me a message to be played on the show, probably. Also, visit bit.ly slash HaasTube to watch my awesome videos, interview clips, fun stuff, educational stuff, dumb music. That's my Haas Bossman YouTube channel. Follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Twitch. I'm Haas underscore Bossman on all those. Also, you can and should support me on Patreon. Also, patreon.com slash Haas underscore Bossman. That's pr- me pretty much everywhere. Rate, review, and share this podcast. And uh, check out Sounds of Breadsheet and get yourself a copy at hossbossman.bandcamp.com. No underscore in that. And make sure and follow today's guest, Rachel Quirky Shank. I just watched one of her uh, Twitch streams the other night. Um, she is on Twitter at I am Rachel Quirky. Uh, check out her Twitch streams at twitch.tv slash Rachel underscore Quirky. She's a newly an affiliate on Twitch, which is exciting as fun. And her podcasts are Screen Snark and the Infinity Podcast. Uh, she'll tell you more in just a sec. The first like 15 minutes or so, we ease in with some like Star Wars and pop culture talk. Then things get gradually more and more serious, but still very fun. All right, now we're off, and here is Ms. Rachel Shank's original bridge sheet theme. Love you all, and stick around for the outro to hear what song I choose to write out on. Be mysterious. I'll probably pick something from Sounds of Breadsheet, so you get to hear once more one of the classic Breadsheet themes. I think y'all are really going to love this conversation. Uh, Peace out, and please enjoy Rachel Quirky Shank. Hello, people of the multiverse. multiverse. I am Rachel Quirky Quirky Shank. 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 Am I audible, Ms. Shank? Yes, you are. Am I? You are audible and visible, too. Ha ha! Am I both of those things? Yes. Excellent. Wonderful. Let me make sure I'm... Hello. I, how you doing? I'm good. Excellent. Yeah, I, you know, I've had too many instances where until like a minute into the interview, I realized I wasn't recording. So it's already recording. Fair, fair warning. I, yeah, I got the Zoom sends a... Uh, like a little pop up it's like hey this meeting's being recorded just so okay. you know so i had to click on a little box so excellent and it's well legal reasons i suppose yeah i guess but i know in new york i just know this i think from watching like a majority report and stuff it's a, a one party state where like the person on the other line doesn't have to know that they're being recorded right i, I think in georgia it's not i at least 10 years ago when I used to record interviews for Flagpole Magazine here, it uh, you had to like legally inform them that they were being recorded, but yeah. this is the case up there. But, um, you know, just to cover all their bases, I guess, Zoom, you know, since it's everywhere. Do you have any uh, any news that maybe like a, a, a scoop from today's recording of uh, Infinity Pod that, that you can give me? Oh, this will probably uh, come out after that airs anyway, but... Oh, uh, we're just talking about The Mandalorian. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> And that's we, we literally we just did the thing was like there's really no news. It was Thanksgiving. Mandalorian? Sure. So we talked about that. And of course I came from the position of uh I'm so glad to see the cartoons that are very very good about Star Wars getting vindicated in live action of just like yes, these cartoons are very good. Yeah, I've been I've been hearing that. I haven't watched any of the new season. I don't think I even watched all of the last one, but what I did see of it was just like really cool. I'm just not really I've never been a huge Star Wars person. I just didn't yeah. grow up with it at all, but like, you know, I I enjoy most of it really except yeah. for you know the latest movie and just the stuff that i think is universally agreed to be just like turds uh, is the stuff i don't like but <laughs> yeah and i and for for the animated stuff uh the the second thing that they created rebels mm-hmm. uh 
is so brilliant because it it is doing what the Mandalorian is trying to do already, like being very episodic, not being connected to like the Palpatine Skywalker Kenobi mm-hmm. situation. Like we do, we do meet Obi Wan in like an episode of Rebels, but like he's not a main character, and like everyone that we're we're hanging out with, there's like the Twi'lek captain, uh, uh. Uh, a, a Jedi who survived the purge, who was young when it happened. So he's kind of like, I don't really know a hundred percent how to be a Jedi, but like, I'll try hmm. my best, you know, it's really cool. And so like, no one is connected to that sort of like star Wars Royal family mm-hmm. line. And it's, and that's, what's really wonderful. And that's what I really like about stuff like the Mandalorian. Cause I'm like, I'm tired of hearing about, yeah, these that. like <laughs> big people i want to i want to know what folks are doing boots on the ground you know yeah that same family hold on i'm going to change the view so that it's easier if i need to edit anything there we go um yeah talking about that same family and not to go immediately go off into star wars talk but i think i, I kind of have like a little bit of a unique perspective on it because i didn't grow up with it like my dad is old so um you know <laughs> he when the first star wars movie came out he would have been like in his early 30s so he just like didn't really ever connect with it at all so i grew up with more like star trek um and kind of older sci-fi stuff but like you know i didn't really watch any of the movies other than you know pop culture you basically have seen all of it by the time Mm. you reach a certain age but like if even if you've never actually seen any of the films but like you know i didn't see any like i watched the whole series in early college and so kind of have like you know, there's stuff that I feel like when um, not being like a fanboy, I think, you know, a lot of fanboy types really liked The Last Jedi, but a lot of them really hated it. I remember yeah. when I walked out of the theater knowing nothing about any reviews, I was like, I think that was like my favorite Star Wars movie I ever saw because it was just like, I, it just seemed to like cater more to people who are just like more interested in a good story than just like getting like satisfied with fan service stuff, you know? Yeah, for sure. I I have walked on both sides of that argument because when I first saw Last Jedi, I did not enjoy it. Mm. Um, but then on a rewatch, I was like, okay, I get it now. Mm-hmm. Uh, also, like when it when it comes to Star Wars, like I'm a fan enough. Like I think I'm a fan because it is a nerdy thing to like, and I like nerdy things. Same here. But like I'm I'm not all on like wikipedia Mm -hmm. looking up everything like i'm excited that ahsoka tano is showing up in in the mandalorian because i really like ahsoka tano i really like the arc that she has through clone wars into rebels you know like this this story of a person who's like adjacent to the royal family but like not so much that like people who didn't watch the cartoon are going to know who Ahsoka is in the Mandalorian. Like they're meeting her for the first time. And I think that's a really special that she like can have so much lore and so much going on for people who watch the cartoons, but also like this introduction to her, like creates this whole new situation for people that have no idea who she is. You know, I love that so much. Yeah. That's, I mean, there's so much stuff, you know, the star Wars universe is obviously huge and there's so much stuff to explore. And I know that's like really satisfying a lot of people who always, you know, I always like the, I like sword fights and magic powers and all that stuff. So I always thought that's Jedi stuff was fun, but like, I totally get the, like just wanting to see how, what everyday life is like more for just normal people normal people in this universe you know and yeah i feel like you we saw more of that in the last jedi which is one thing i like so but also there are people whose opinions i really respect who didn't like the last jedi who like they didn't like it for like legitimate reasons that we've talked about but like then there's also of course the the ding dongs who hated it because there was like an asian character in it or whatever yeah (laughs) yeah i remember one of my biggest complaints was the the not that I hold like what the force is very sacred, you know, like play with it. But I just didn't really understand like how the force suddenly became like, oh, you can zoom call people and <laughs> the water you'll get wet, like in more ways than one when you do a force zoom call, you know, it was just kind of it was off putting. But then when I sort of got past that, like, what is the force to me, like getting into a story about like letting things go that do not serve us anymore was really interesting. And like, I came back around on sort of like what the message was about who were the Jedi? 
what will they be if they return? Like, what does it mean? You know, because again, I I already did this on on uh, on the Infinity podcast, but like to quote Anakin, like in my mind, the Jedi are evil. You mm -hmm. know, like there's so much to be said about like when we fleshed out Jedi in the prequels, like they kind of became unfortunately like cops you know and that kind of stunk a lot <laughs> yeah um, you know like when it when it became like it was the clone wars and they're the military and it's just like man that stinks you know yeah and uh, star wars and this might segue us into naturally into kind of what i was planning on talking about more like star wars uh has always had a problem with internal <laughs> consistency in a lot of ways but mm -hmm. i think just a lot of different people have their hands in it and unlike with uh, something like the Marvel Universe, which just is a lot more internally consistent, I think, uh, than most things, most uh, franchises yeah. in general. There's there's so much in the in the catalog to pull from for Marvel mm -hmm. versus Star Wars, which were a movie that became three movies, then like thirty years later became six movies, mm -hmm. and there there were like comics and and other books and stuff, but they were building off like literally what like nine maybe nine hours of of visual storytelling surrounding like four very important characters you know like it wasn't an ever-expanding thing at the time and so every new thing that came along was kind of like the first of its existence you know like who knew that it was a galactic senate before it was an empire <laughs> You know? Yeah, and that's you know something about even though so much of the stuff that Lucas did, especially with the prequels, is not great. It's I at least you know I want to live in a world where like artists are allowed to try to say things and mm -hmm. can at least especially with that that Anakin line you quoted. You know I think he's done very sloppily and clunkily, but he's very clearly trying to say something about like in, in with that line, and I think a lot of stuff with the way he did the prequels, like how seeing things from different perspectives can really change the way that you view it. And I really appreciate at least the attempt. Yeah. And I think we always discount the idea that George Lucas was making these films in the Bush era. Like mm -hmm. we have, a we have like this weird political conflict circling around like trade relations, <laughs> you know, and, and the, the, the disillusion of, of like a Senate, you know, in, in favor of like a fascist dictator, you know, and it just like, I think George is trying so hard to like comment on what is happening politically without commenting on it. And I think trying to do that in, in the space wizards movie maybe was a little too much, <laughs> but I will say I would have loved to have seen George Lucas's, uh, like post, uh, uh skywalker trilogy with with the wills and the microbiology of the okay Force. yeah i would have loved that because like i think george lucas could have gotten so much more buck wild and i think we would have loved it this time around it certainly i think would have been more interesting than what oh as a whole they did with the new trilogy i think even if yeah. it had been like a huge you know misstep at least it would have been like more fun to talk about probably <laughs> yeah because i will say full out i will revisit the prequels more often than i will revisit the like f for skywalker jedi saga you know yeah. Um, yeah, they're, I think as a whole, the prequels are, I don't know, For Force Awakens and Last Jedi are pretty solid, but like, you know, th that last one is just such a so bad. steaming turd. <laughs> it's like, it's it so bad. It made the other ones worse for, yeah. <laughs> for it because now you're just like, well, I used to be Ray from nowhere. Now I'm, now I'm not that, you know, like. I used to be nobody and it's like and then you're going to say Skywalker at the end of this and it's going to suck so bad. <laughs> yeah, it it really uh changed a lot and um that you know usually I'm pretty good about this is one reason I just don't think I would be like focusing on like media criticism. I, a lot of the people like Patrick Willems and you know all the YouTubers who do a lot of like film analysis uh mm -hmm. on on YouTube it's never really been like my thing. I'm I'm much maybe bet for better or worse, uh, 
like better about when I go in to see a movie, just sort of handing my brain over to it and letting it like just do what it's trying to do and being forgiving of, you know, logical inconsistencies and stuff like that. And, um, you know, which I think is something that some of the better film critics do kind of advocate for to a certain degree like not doing the whole cinema sins nitpicky thing yeah no let's not i <laughs> and and i approach uh cinema through the lens of was it a good story did 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 its beginning its middle and its end do something you know mm -hmm. was not not to say that i'm completely married to you know that sort of hero's journey idea but like if i'm going to sit down and watch something even if it's like wackadoo buck wild like at the bare bones did our did our protagonist like go through something like that we mm -hmm. can empathize with and understand you know like i just i just watched uh fast and the furious tokyo drift mm. uh very recently i'm finally getting to watching all of the fast and furious movies um i'd already watched one and two like decades ago when they like first came out so i was like i'll just watch tokyo drift and that movie is buck wild <laughs> and it makes some choices like how is this how did this teenager on his first day of school, find the underground racing ring. How did that happen? And it doesn't matter because like at the end of the day, it's this kid who like find who has this like found family experience and sort of like finds a way to make this thing he loves to do and obsessively has to do like street racing into something that is exciting and sort of like this tiny little journey for this person of just like what do i do with this you know and it is very like age of ultron like he gets in trouble for racing and can only fix it by racing but you know it was still like a fun story and and, and an enjoyable experience to live with these characters in this kind of like buck wild world yeah i mean that's so i haven't seen most i like you i think i saw the first one and maybe some of the second one way back when they came yeah. out but like i haven't done that like watch through which i know i'm gonna enjoy because of just like you know the the people who really seem to love it i i i who, people who are good at that like i understand what this movie is trying to do and i'm just gonna sit back and enjoy it and take it in for what it is they seem like yeah. kind of perfect for that sort of thing i would recommend tokyo drift <laughs> <laughs> i absolutely would it's so wacky i love it i i know it's yeah it's supposed to be like really insane but um so okay so we're we're off to a good start uh for breadsheet i go pretty tangential on this show a lot especially the last like i did this really long interview with this guy chris crofton who's just hilarious and a great musician but like both of us really chaotic energy all over the place and that was a lot of fun um but you know we're able to steer it back to politics and you know the stuff i try to touch on on this show a lot so um i guess since we're already i don't know how long into this conversation but uh you want to like just quickly you know introduce yourself to my audience people who might not be aware of the stuff that you do like your podcasts and like some of the other artists you collaborate with and that sort of thing Sure. Um, hi, everyone uh, out there on the Internet. I am I am Rachel uh, Quirky Shank uh, and I am a podcaster, uh, performance artist, Twitch affiliate uh, weirdo who just wants to make dumb things. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's that's who I am. My uh, I mean, should I should I tell them my podcast now or are we going to do like a plug sesh? I don't I, I never know how to do this. Let's, you know, I usually record an intro afterward to try and like tie things together a little bit, but cool, cool, cool. Yeah, go ahead and uh, like just uh, your your two main podcasts, I guess, and sort of the main things you would want to touch on or you know want people to know about. Sure, yeah. Um, my my first, po I'll do it in the order that they were born. Uh, sure. My first podcast is a movie and television uh, casual interview podcast called Screen Snark. Uh, my co-host uh, Matt Stormageddon and I sit down with a guest every week, talk about the last thing we watched, and sort of uh, conducted like a brief interview with the person who's in who's in the guest seat. Uh, and the other podcast I do uh, is called the Infinity Podcast, and it is formerly a Marvel movie podcast now a uh pop culture being affected by popular comics podcast so you know that kind of that kind of gives us sort of a blanket of exploration in things you know mm -hmm. so we can talk about carly ray jepson and 
my hero academia and be like, it's fine. Comics. Haha. <laughs> yeah. We're figuring it out. Popular culture. These are things that are happening. So just finding the the marriage between those two things in sort of our like post MCU monoculture situation, I guess. Sure. Yeah. No. And it's both of those are great. Uh, the um, I was pretty, I think, completely introduced to you through the Infinity podcast, you know, and I think I saw it tagged at the or, you know, advertised for at the end of like one of uh, Patrick Willem's videos or something. And I uh, started listening to that. And uh, it is like, uh, where I go, which I think I mentioned this in our uh, tarot session, um, that uh, it's usually where I get my like just little cliff notes on what's happening with especially popular music from one of the co-hosts on there, Scott. Yeah, he, me too. Yeah, just follows. <laughs> I'm that on stuff. that show, <laughs> yeah. and I'm like, I learn something every week. <laughs> Yeah. And, um, you know, things that nobody has time, especially, you know, nowadays to consume everything. So it's nice to just get like a little a rundown from like the areas I don't see quite as much of, um, including comics. You know, I don't have I feel like I love reading comics, but I just feel like there's just not enough time in the day to really get into them. You know, I'll I'll get some some summaries of like some good stuff that's out there and like add them to my to read list, which is like 10 miles long at this point. Growing but. and growing. Mine, too. I Full disclosure, uh, we read comics and I essentially just read a comic for our show because <laughs> mm -hmm. I, too, am very bad at like consistently reading comics. It's also a difficult task when we're all trapped inside and I'm cohabitating. So most of the entertainment that I partake in is like stuff we do together, you know, mm -hmm. like watching a show or playing a video game. So it's difficult. Like I'm miles behind on podcasts I used to listen to and things I used to read because it's just weird to try and do this solo activity in this house. Like we're not very good at sideways play. We like to always play together mm -hmm. as 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 our as our as our cohabitation. It's kind of amazing that I've just been spending like Every waking hour, my girlfriend and I, who also are cohabitating, uh, you know, that we've sort of, uh, you know, it's I think a lot of people's relationships have been either <laughs> taken to a, a bad place or uh, people who are still sort of like, man, I can't believe we're not completely sick of each other at this point. Um, you know, I think it's uh, we've learned a lot about ourselves and our relationships in this time and how we yeah. consume media and all that stuff. So, oh, for sure. Um, so, uh, so yeah. I guess now getting into the political stuff, uh, where are you from originally? I don't know if we've if I've really taken much of that in on your other shows, and like, did that influence you know your politics at all, and you know your your family background, that kind of thing? Uh, yeah, I was uh, born and raised in Evansville, Indiana. Huh. Uh, so I am I am from I am from the Midwest, uh, and. Uh, I don't think I've ever strayed too far away from this, like the center politically growing up. Um, I, I guess what I would call myself now, looking back at who I was, I was a, a Catholic Democrat hmm. um, as, as a young person, you know, it, it's kind of weird to have grown up in a place so deeply Republican as, you know, not that um, I don't think I ever, ever, liked any Republicans, even as young as I was. Uh, so I was definitely very like for helping the working, the working class, like before I had the definition for it, you know, because uh, my my father uh, still is for a, a little bit longer, a factory worker. Um, and my mother was a, a stay at home mom and she like watched the kids of my family members so like she was sort of a nanny and you know it, it was just kind of like that was the dynamic like we were never well off um mm -hmm. so like social programs i was always pro social programs you know like let's really help each other you know and 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 be there um, but I, I was unfortunately uh anti-choice uh because of the catholic sure. uh but as as I grew older and saw more of the world and understood more of where I where I lived and what it looked like, I I've I don't think I've stuck with that opinion very long. Mm -hmm. Especially when I got older and I like saw folks, you know, like struggling 
and going, you shouldn't, you shouldn't have to have a kid. You shouldn't be forced to do that. Mm. That would be really bad for like you and for them. So I think that was the, the most conservative my politics ever really got. Mm -hmm. Um, Not to like drag out my dirty laundry politically. Mm -hmm. uh, But I think like most people, um, I was most drastically radicalized after the election of 2016. Mm. Uh, but before that, I was starting to get that feeling of like, I think I'm being exploited. <laughs> I think the things that I'm doing don't pay me enough. And the things that I'm doing don't keep me safe. <laughs> so Yeah. Like when you, you, know. when you really get into that mindset, it's, it's hard not to see it when you start trying thinking about things systemically and then like, you know, applying them to your own situation. And then a lot of like seeing people who, you know, liberals uh, and everybody to the right of that, who might be like, you know, better off in their own situation, sort of, uh, being sort of apologetic for the capitalist class and that sort of thing, like it starts to kind of make less and less sense the more you sort of learn about it and experience real life, which is the opposite of what conservatives say should happen, right? Like as you experience yeah. real life, you're supposed to become more conservative is what they say. But I think that only applies if you happen to be very lucky and get a decent job with benefits and stuff and actually be able to sustain yourself and a family. Yeah, for sure. When When you sort of reach that level of... I don't I don't want to call out the middle class, but I think that like the middle class living is kind of that place where you are still exploited, but not enough that it like hurts anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, not so much that it's like my my life is in danger through lack of employment. You know, I think once you sort of like break past that, I think that is where that phrase kind of lives in that space of you're fine you mm. like you own you own a home or you don't have student debt or any any sundry of material things that can create this comfort where you don't have to think about it yeah yeah i mean and that's i think something that recently with the pandemic and the economic downturn we're kind of i think one big reason we're seeing a lot of people's consciousness move more into like a class conscious space is that people are starting to realize that they've kind of taken their um you know coasting on their situation for granted like oh this shit is affecting me now or might affect me and and is affecting people i know you know so yeah it's it's interesting to see how quickly a realization has sort of come up across the board of just it's weird that my health care is tied to my employment but a deadly disease has made my employment impossible for some reasons and now i can't get medical care because of that during a and it's kind of like i'm seeing people kind of like live with that logic you know and i think that's why initiatives like medicare for all has become not so buck wild and out of left field where it's like no like maybe we should just all have health care and not die i guess maybe <laughs> i've been radicalized <laughs> sure <Congrats. laughs> yeah um so did uh how did you wind up in new york i mean was it just like a college to job type situation or like you know what what kind of brought you there well i went to school for theater uh so i moved to new york to become an actor Mm -hmm. and very quickly decided that is that was not the path for me at the time um a lot of it has to do with um being being a femme actor uh there's just there's a whole other levels of commodification and demand for aesthetic uh, that I never particularly enjoyed. Even in college, it was it was weird. I I remember being in a show and the demand was we all needed to look more emaciated because we were doing a piece uh, called Jacques Brel is Alive and Well and Living in Paris. And of course, Jacques Brel was a uh, a singer from uh, from Belgium, um, lived, uh, was a compatriot with like Edith Piaf, you know, so kind of singing these very like political songs, um, 
you know, uh, there's one called Sons of, which is like Sons of the Thief or Sons of the Saint, who is the child with no complaints. I, obviously, uh, uh, translated. Um, I, I, I don't I don't speak any other language than this one. I'm sorry. Um, Same here. So it was really interesting to do this very like politically charged piece, but then also have to deal with the politics of asking like young 20 somethings to lose weight like the the idea was everyone had to lose some amount of weight and some some had to lose more than others but like i was positively wayfish at the time like i was so skinny mm -hmm. i cannot believe how skinny i was and they were like you need to lose at least five more pounds and it was just this really odd moment where like i was so eager to please and so so like willing to do this you know, they also like cut our hair, you know, and I'd never cut my hair before. So it was like this weird boundary that was sort of removed from me against my will. Mm -hmm. um, so it was just like a lot of that. And I sort of like carried that trauma for a while as as a as a as a woman shaped actor um, and then sort of realized that I was not ready or willing to be rejected for these arbitrary reasons based on like my appearance or my weight or my hair color or my hair length. Uh, and then I sort of fell into the burlesque scene, which is kind of the complete opposite of that. Like the amount of autonomy and control and self-love that that industry sort of brought through was a a big change for me and it was a way to sort of like illuminate that I could own my own creativity like I could make all of the decisions from 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 beginning to end of act everything was mine to choose and that was really exciting and really invigorating because like I'd spent so much of my time being directed being told you're going to play this role and you're going to play it this way you know and there there isn't as much of a like well, I have these ideas. What if we did this? You know, it's more like speak your lines, do do your sh look pretty. You know, um, not to say that it was bad. It's just, you know, like there's there's not a complete and total ownership of the instrument. You know, like my body, my voice, these things that belong to me being put in the hands of others for them to make the decisions um so while i was in while i was doing burlesque really exploring that idea of like making my own stuff and being my own voice and my own director i started a, a comedy duo um we do <laughs> problematic comedy music you know it was the the 2010s sure Every, everyone was an edge lord at the time <laughs> um so i also i also did that in like a, a very deep collaboration like we would make decisions together like very like we wouldn't do things that the other didn't want to do and we like really got to work together and i love collaborating as much as i love being my own boss i love working with other people like that's mm -hmm. my love language like let's make something weird together let's go nuts um but yeah so that's kind of the journey uh through from college to new york and now i podcast which is yeah. collaborating and being my own boss at the same time and something that you can uh do i guess uh well for one thing burlesque i really i'm you know familiar with the aesthetic of it and uh pretty much the only thing i know about it is that uh one simpsons episode remember where there's like a, a burlesque house is built in spring or like you know started in springfield and then uh everybody you know all the speaking of um catholics the you know the church the reverend lovejoy um everybody's all appalled at yeah. a house of burlesque is in our community now and i you know i think i when i was that age i thought it was that man it was just like a you know like a cat house type thing or something oh, like yeah. that but yeah the the first burlesque show i ever saw was actually one that i didn't choose to go to i was working as a cocktail waiter uh at a at a music venue and they were doing a night of burlesque and i was just on the schedule and my my tiny little like god fearing brain <laughs> like just fresh off the boat from the midwest being asked to do this burlesque show i was like there's there's gonna be like they're going to do cocaine. I just know it. And it was just like this really scary idea in my head and seeing what it really was, which was just a celebration of self and like weird brains concocting weird acts and just being like, I am a human body and I am normal 
I'm average, I'm whatever, and like you're welcome to look at this, to look at me in in my in my flesh, in the body that I have that I'm not fucking with and like trying to hurt to look like some some standard. You're welcome. And like people loved it and it like changed my life. Like it that, that moment changed my entire life, you know? Like I I try not to think like it was a religious experience, but like if I had only watched that burlesque show and not decided to pursue it, I would have been a different person either way because it was just like, oh no, like you can just be a person, like a, like a regular human being and like throw some throw some glitter on and get out there and, and people will cheer for you. And I think that everyone deserves to stand in front of a crowd to whatever level of undress that they are comfortable with and have people cheer for them. I think that it is a life changing experience. That that is beautiful. No, yeah, and that's um, I depending on where people are from, you know, they might not be as familiar or just like the word burl- might just associate it with that Simpsons episode. Like, you know, that's where most of my <laughs> familiarity with it came from. And yeah. you know, probably uh, the type of thing that just like different types of performance art and whatnot are probably more common in you know bigger cities that have more art scenes. Um, but uh, yeah, that's a, a common theme. I've you know back when I used to more. Uh, interview like entertainer types and not really get into politics too much with them usually uh and but then you know with these more recent ones that i've been doing a a kind of common theme that i see is this like there's this one like moment that people have that's like oh either i just completely misunderstood something before this or you know i'm now i kind of like get this this whole new universe of things to like play with and Mm -hmm. you know familiarize myself self with has uh opened up here and um yeah no i think that's that's a a a beautiful uh story um you know and about this like I feel like that's something we're seeing more of nowadays, people being more like body positive and yeah. the wide variety of body types that there are for, you know, any gender or whatever. And just like how people choose to identify people just like celebrating that individuality more. And I think it's great. Yeah. And and the burlesque scene was one of the most important stepping stones for my understanding of like the LGBTQ plus community. Like I know I was in theater, but I was in theater in the Midwest and like, it, it it was rare to see anyone like fully open about their 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 gender identity or their sexuality you know like it was kind of interesting because like i didn't really know that i was whatever gender fucked i am and and not straight and not monogamous like these were things i didn't i didn't parse with myself but to see other people like very very open about like who they are what they are what they want in in their in their life you know sexually or whatever you know just like made me go oh i don't i don't think i'm monogamous and then it was like i don't think i'm straight i was like i don't think that i'm a hundred percent a girl all the time like i don't know but it just like it offered that language just even even further you know it gave me these tools to really start to understand who i was and like what is happening to people i care about you know i just i don't think i would be the 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 lefto anarcho-communist i am without the burlesque community you know yeah no and i I think that's like a key to unlocking a a lot of things is this just coming to the understanding that things you used to think of as binary or black and white are actually on this spectrum and then realizing you can apply that logic to so many different things in life um but yeah no that's uh fantastic and uh, you already touched on that you're from a a working class background um and Mm -hmm. uh so a uh, Catholic Democrat, maybe for I think a lot of America is probably just now being uh, exposed to what that means kind of through Joe Biden. So maybe like go into a little bit what you mean by that. Um, I think it's just a way to sort of like uh, elucidate that, like some of my politics were liberal, but some of them were conservative based mm. in like what my religious ideologies were, m- mostly when it came to uh like pregnant people's bodily autonomy Mm -hmm. you know like when it came to that i had very 
closed ideas about what life was when it began why it is sacred why it should not be taken you know it, definitely that i don't think i ever was catholic enough to have problems with anyone from the lgbtq community i don't think i ever really ha carried that prejudice that i can recall you know, i'm sh i'm sure i had tons of biases you know but i don't think i was ever like Oh, there's a there's a gay man. I you're gonna go to hell. I never really subscribed to that. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with like the fact that my mom is a non practicing person. Like she has no religious affiliation. I wouldn't I wouldn't take uh 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 her voice and say she's an atheist, but she doesn't. She she goes to church with my family because like it's her family. Mm -hmm. I don't know like where she stands on like other forces and all of that but she was a very like progressive voice in my life and i i remember many times having the debate discussion where she was coming from the position of pro-choice and i was coming from the position of anti-choice and we would have these sort of like really interesting discussions and she would try and like understand me and and it was very socratic which was really cool because like i learned to while i didn't think that having an abortion was morally correct i did understand that like some people don't have any other options you know and it sort of became this slow peel away of like no like i don't i don't subscribe to the things that i that i did before so that's why i say catholic democrat like just more like that morality leaning toward certain policies mm -hmm. um, but also because i i i did attend a private catholic school uh i was not really influenced by other cultures like my my graduating class was very large for the school we had uh uh 75 graduating students in my class it was a very large class wow. for this school and all like almost all of them were white you know mm -hmm. so just like if you want to just re replace catholic with white you can also do that <laughs> you know and just i was not because honestly i there weren't a lot of like people of color that i knew were associated with because in 1913 my hometown had a race riot so you know kind of kind of changes the demographic sure uh, uh where 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 people of color were run out of town <laughs> in yeah. very terrifying ways uh you can look it up 1913 the evansville indiana uh race riot uh, i won't go into too much detail because i think that you can do your research uh <laughs> look it up but you know that's kind of where the demographic shift lives mm -hmm. not to say that we are without uh diversity it's just i was not forced to see it you know like i was very sheltered very privileged as a white person growing up in a white town going to a white school um but i don't i don't again i don't think i ever really like looked at anyone who was a different ethnicity and was like you're gonna go to hell i never really thought anyone would go to hell yeah that's the thing <laughs> like i was a catholic who was just like i don't think like if our god is like a like a chill dude like if this god is a god that i wish to worship and i wish to like put my faith into i just don't think that someone like my mom who is unbaptized who is so kind and so giving and put so much of herself into the into the things she's doing for this church and this school that i'm a part of as they will not let her join social clubs because she's not baptized like living with that feeling of like my mother is an outsider in a thing that i believe in and like some people that believe the same thing as me think that she's gonna have eternal damnation because of it and i just can't believe in that i just can't i can't get into that idea because mm -hmm. that's so arbitrary and unfair you know and then that sort of sent the ball rolling into like well what other parts of this dogma are weird and wrong and i don't like and it was all of it it was all <laughs> of it and i stopped being a catholic like very shortly after starting college it was like i'll just take my grandma sing the songs hang out do whatever yeah. but you know in terms of my personal faith journey it kind of fizzled out when i became a real adult yeah, I think, you know, here in, in the, the U.S., uh, the types of sort of Christian or religious politics that take front and center, you know, because of population density of this 
population, I guess, of like, uh, you know, the the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant um, sort of type of, uh, or, you know, brand of conservatism, which I think does dwell a little, you know, obviously this is coming from a place of that's mostly what I'm familiar with, but that does dwell a little bit more in the judgmental, you're going to hell type stuff. Whereas like, seems like, Catholicism or people who follow Catholicism or that's their tradition tend to be a little bit more of like, you know, the way a lot of Jewish people are, which I really like respect and wish that more Christians could be like this, that it's like, you know, I don't really literally believe in it, the supernatural stuff or whatever, but I, you know, it's my culture, it's my background. And I think that that type, you know, tradition isn't like complete bullshit in every possible way. Yeah. But, you know, there, I imagine with like, you know, a, Catholic Democrat, for instance, might be something like having more liberal, quote unquote, like social policies in terms of like helping the poor and racial equality. But then maybe uh, in addition to the I think most people probably associate like the, you know, Catholic conservative being very anti-choice. Um, but also I would imagine maybe there's some more like emphasis on traditional gender roles yeah patriarchal mm -hmm. uh, uh positions of power you know you can you definitely see that men lead the conversation when it comes to the the path of the church like it is it has not happened yet uh that a that a woman has been a member of the catholic clergy women are nuns and men are priests and deacons and bishops and the pope and all of that it's still very much that like you know very like patriarchal situation and also a very a very for those of you who don't maybe under like understand or know like people of the cloth in Catholicism, they are married to the church. Uh, so they do not have spouses. Uh, they do not uh, have romantic relationships, at least not public ones. Um, you know, because I mean, like, we're all like humans. Uh, but in, in essence, like, a nun is married to Christ and a priest is married to the church. Um as ideas so like th there's also that so it's very much like a a sacred marriage and you can't have more than one marriage um so that's that's weird yeah <laughs> it's like every everyone who wants to have sex should have sex with other people that also want to have sex you know like everyone consent <laughs> everyone ever if you're into it i'm into it let's get into it you know yeah <laughs> important disclaimer there that uh, yeah. everybody should be consenting sure yeah, yeah everybody um... <laughs> who wants to really wants to with other people that also really want to yeah. love it yeah it, it makes me really sad when i think about all the generations of our comrades before us who could not live their full lives because of oppression you know mm -hmm. not to sugarcoat it but like the 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 oppression of their existence you know and it sucks it sucks really bad and not to say that we're out of the woods on that like there's still plenty of of folks who cannot be themselves to their most perfect potential because of social constructs and you know family family ties and all of those things it's really it, it lays me low when i think about it too much you know because i i even though i was raised catholic i was very lucky that i was allowed to both opt into and opt out of it because mm -hmm. i was i i was baptized for sure and then a I was going to public school and around second, third grade, like I started going to Sunday school because like it was just a thing, you know, that my folks wanted. I don't think we weren't attending church at the time. And then I got to decide that we would start practicing as a family. Like I was like, I want to know more about this this part of my heritage that I haven't really known up to this point. And so like it was my decision to go from public school to private school. And then it was my decision to stop going to church. Like I was very autonomous in my religious journey, which was really great because I can I can see where a lot of folks like are born into it, stick with it, are stuck with it. You know, I was I was super lucky, you know, to have such cool rad parents who were <laughs> like, okay, yeah, you want to start going to St. Wendell? That's fine cool we'll figure it out you sure. know my brother attended public school his whole like life like he mm -hmm. went from the the public middle to the public high and i like 
did the private school thing. My folks were like, cool, that's what you want. Live it. That that is awesome. Yeah, no, and that's I mean, you know, my family are uh, uh Baptist, but not I, you know, it's like people identify as religious and then they have their own. I think something especially in the south here there's a lot of uh a lot of folk wisdom type uh reasoning that people have and so they just sort of make up their own rules about it and that's sort of the background i'm from like we just we didn't really go to church but it's we were supposed to technically be religious but you know i think also uh there my dad being like very conservative and but then whenever i started getting into being more of a, a liberal and then a leftist and just like as a teenager he was always and became you know atheist during that time too you know he would always like be open to talking to me about that stuff and you know i think that's really good that you know if you're if you have kids to um let them be themselves always make sure they can be open and honest about it and make their own choices uh you know within reason i guess yeah because if you if you are like a like a chill parent about it like you're probably going to find that your kid is not going to push back against you uh my my obviously my faith led to a lot of decisions about like my sexuality and my 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 use of it um i i didn't become sexually active until pretty late in in my life um but also not only did i not want to i wasn't given that sort of like it would be fun to rebel kind of discussion because my mom made it so not cool at uh, all she was like the moment you want to just let me know we'll we'll get you on the pill like don't worry like uh, let me like we like just just talk to me about it and like she's my best friend like mm -hmm. my whole life you know like i was i was a i was a weird art kid you know for for all of it every fucking second it was so weird and like kids didn't really like me very much and that's fine you know kids are mean uh sure. but like my mom was always my my best friend through mm -hmm. like everything like i was like like 13 years old and someone's like who's your best friend i'm like my mom <laughs> like it's adorable yeah, it's like she's <laughs> fucking rules like my mom is so rad like she's she's she she's getting too old to have our like good old political fights and also like i've gotten so far left that she's just like i can't with you i can't, we can't we have to have a nice thanksgiving stop it <laughs> you know i don't want you fighting with your brother about whether or not he was a capitalist or not <laughs> Yeah, sh certainly uh, getting into those um, now that radical politics are are more uh, acceptable or what maybe used to be considered radical is like a more in the mainstream conversation, at least um, that, you know, I could I can just see that with so many people being open to talking about these things and i think often though it's it's surprising when you uh, bring up the leftist perspective with people who are like, you know, liberals who you know i've been having some conversations with some some pretty dead center liberals uh recently who it's it's really interesting to see when you just start bringing up like marxian uh, analysis and like just some kind of more leftist perspectives to things how it's just like they've literally never thought about it from that point of view and um i think that's you know one one reason i started doing this podcast was like you know eh, i've got well you know pandemic we've got all this free time now i might as well start trying to like sow some seeds and you know try and spread these views that i've always kind of tried to express through like music in these third hand ways like i'm I'm just gonna fucking talk about it straight up so yeah thank um, you thank you for doing that work i i have very lit i have very little love for the 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 free market of ideas and debating like mm. i am i am i am a died in the wool propagandist and i'm not here to debate it like all cops are bastards and if you want to fight me on it don't because i because you won't win. Number one, you won't win. You're already wrong by 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 just not sitting and recognizing that like these are these are the state sanctioned violent ghouls that could murder you with impunity. So no, I just I can't. I'm not a great debater at all. Like I'm I'm definitely like I'm gonna be on my soapbox. I'm gonna say my piece, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna bust out of here. And like it's not. It's not a question of well, are they? It's like they are. They every single <laughs> like every single one of them chooses every day to put on that uniform and propagate violence. So no. Yeah, no, and I I totally agree, and I, I wouldn't be like I so don't, firm. <laughs> I'm so bad about debating. I hate it. I get I get so like 
Like, I'll please let me just go to a protest and shout with a group of people. I'm not an individual, like, world fixer or educator. I'm just here to be a body in this movement. And I want to be a loud one. Or, yeah, no, I think that is a very important thing. And I think that uh, that's I, I would say I'm bad at debating. But one thing I've been trying to get better at, and I think that something about being from a very conservative town and just knowing a lot of people, I think, you know, I don't I've never been interested. Like, I don't want to bring people on this show to debate. I would be interested in talking to like Trump supporters and stuff, but like actually just having a conversation with them. Um, you know, I. I've known a lot of people through and this is something I've been bringing up with people lately is like I I've I've known people in my life who are pretty fucking racist and like you know will tell racist jokes and even like use the n word and stuff who but I've also known some liberals who say all the right things and who if I were a black person or an LGBTQ person I would trust this person who I've heard say openly racist things with my life more than I would some liberals I've known. So it's not all really that simple. I think that some people just have like, uh, you know, this last interview I did with Chris Crofton, he just put it so well. It's like some people just have fucking bad information. And, you know, it is important to get that information out there in a way that is sort of like empathetic in a way. Oh, yeah. But I think that, you know, also just being firm in that because it's like, like you were saying, you know, like you can't really when you just run down the facts of something like the, you know, a cab situation, <laughs> when you just run down the facts, it's really you can't deny it. That's why right wingers, when you see them actually trying to debate, they just change the subject constantly. Yeah, it is. And that is and that is another reason why it is infuriating to for me to debate folks, because like I'm not a very good debater, but I do understand how good debates work mm -hmm. and nothing will make me hate talking to you more than if you're doing like straw men bullshit or what about ism because it's mm -hmm. like you are not actually debating me like that's actually what is happening is not a debate mm -hmm. and I don't like debating, but like at the very least, if you're going to force me to do this thing that I fucking hate, at least do it well. So at least I can like respect where you're coming from. Um, you know, it's just it's it's very difficult when someone is against a, like genderless bathrooms, like fully like genderless bathrooms, just because like the idea of a man in a dress is so upsetting to you that you will deny people dignity. You know, that's not that's not a debate argument. Like you are literally building a straw man in a dress. Yeah. That's what you're doing. That's not good debating and I don't want to play with it. And mm -hmm. and I am I am I am so aware of my boundaries with folks that like it, one or one or two too many like interactions where it's like you're not actually playing in good faith in this space. You're done. Like you're out. Like I don't I don't have time. Uh, let better like cooler heads deal mm -hmm. with you and bring you <laughs> over here because like Again, I'm a propagandist. I'm just over here like saying the words enough that they don't sound like crazy talk anymore. You sure. <laughs> know? Like, trying to really like move that discussion. So like I'm going to say like the like the full out like all cops are bastards. Like I'll say it a lot. I'll say it all the time because like I want my political machinations to be like pop music. Like I want to <laughs> keep like playing that song on loop until you start to go oh yeah uh-huh okay you know like <laughs> again yeah. like i'm a i'm a pop culture propagandist like that is what mm -hmm. i am doing and like you can take that in a negative way if you wish but like my propaganda is going to lead to you having dignity and rights so Sure. I think that's something the whole like repetition being better at like marketing, which kind of makes sense that right wingers would be better at marketing than left wingers. But, uh, yeah. you know, like that's something that the right and maybe not just the right, but, you know, the sort of more mainstream traditional modes of being type of like just stuff we take for granted. Um, the reason that people believe things like a lot of people just grow up, you know, until I was nine or ten years old i guess and my uh sister who's like six years older than me came home with the first gay person i who i knew was gay who i ever met was you know one of her friends from and that she went to high school with and you know 
when I like hung out with him and talked to him, I was like, oh, gay people are just like, I, I you know, just assume this whole time that they're like weirdos or yeah. sex fiends or something like that. And it's like, you know, just understanding that uh, those like once people are just exposed to the ideas, it's like that's really a lot of times you just need to plant that seed. You don't really need to convince them because yeah. if you're confident that your ideas are right. Basically, you just need to ask them the right questions and they will do the rest on their own. Oh, often. yeah. I'm so bad at the Socratic method. Like, <laughs> I'm, I literally am just like, you're wrong and you're wrong and also you're wrong. Goodbye. Like, uh -huh. so, please, please don't try to debate me, bro. Like, no, because it won't it won't go well because I'll just say, like, no, it's this and bye forever. And now bye forever. Yeah. Um, um, but yeah, so like I, I, I know that my strength is in amplifying the ideas mm -hmm. that that better people have formed. And I think you're very good at it. You know, the, and the, you. the way you kind of like inject it on um, uh, the Infinity podcast is a lot of fun because I can tell that uh, Patrick is, um, I think he seems like he's, you know, pretty, pretty good politics. He doesn't like try to keep it a secret, really. It's just, you know, that's not his main interest. It's not what he wants yeah. his work to be about. I totally respect that. Um, uh, but and so like whenever you bring that stuff up, it's kind of like uh, this like little bit of like tension, but also like it's not because people are really disagreeing. It's just because it's like, mm, yeah, we I kind of do like see where you're coming from on that. <laughs> yeah. Know? And I think that when it comes to the discussions that we have on the infinity podcast, like when we're talking about industry stuff, like just like what Patrick does and what Patrick knows, because like, that's what we're, that's what we're talking about. Like, what do I know? Mm -hmm. I know these things like, you know, I've, I've, I've listened to, these progressive leftist mutualist communist anarchist voices like and and i understand where they're coming from and so like i sort of have a like not an expertise but like an understanding you know and like patrick doesn't and that's perfectly fine and mm -hmm. you can absolutely see our role switch when it's time to talk about the industry of making movies you know like i will just be like i don't understand yeah. what this is but like i'm not i'm not gonna fight you because you know you understand more about this than i do and like i get to learn and i hope that patrick does feel the same way about when when i get into like in like an anti-capitalist discussion about a, a very like vibrant piece of capitalism which is like the commodification of art for profit mm -hmm which is what which is what everything is you know like we're all sort of held at the whims of like how do you commodify a thing mm -hmm. how do you make it make money you know and then you're dealing with hollywood movies that are like billions of dollars like it's <laughs> like the, the highest stakes capitalism you can do yeah, I think that actually kind of segues into. We've been going for a little over an hour now. I don't. I want to be mindful oh, wow. of your time. Do you have like a, a hard out at a certain time or anything like I, that? Uh, my hard out is six p.m. So. Okay. <laughs> well, we can go like you know maybe like another 20, 30 minutes, something like cool, that. Yeah, I, I usually yeah, try yeah. to go just a little bit under or a little bit over an hour to. Hello, people Hello. of the multiverse. The multiverse. I am Rachel Porky Shank. She wrote for today. Thank you so much for tuning in to this week's episode of Breadsheet. Come back in a week or less for part two of Miss Shank's delightful interview in which we dig into politics a lot more and get real down and dirty. So once again, before we ride out on 
I'm going to play uh, Jordan Holmes theme again because that one's pretty funny. It's got some Alex Jones clips in there. That's Jordan Holmes from the Knowledge Fight podcast. And I believe episodes five and seven he's the guest in or like seven and nine maybe. I don't know. Just look back. Jordan Holmes. Those are great episodes talking about his book and Alex Jones and all that stuff and satire and parody. Visit bit.ly slash HossTube, my YouTube channel. Uh, that's the Hoss Bossman YouTube channel. Follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Twitch at Hoss underscore Bossman. Also, support me on Patreon, patreon.com slash Hoss underscore Bossman. And www.hoss.fun. Rate, review, and share this podcast. Check out Sounds of Breadsheet, hossbossman.bandcamp.com. And make sure that you follow Rachel Quirky Shank once again at I am Rachel Quirky. Check out her Twitch streams at twitch.tv slash Rachel underscore Quirky. Um, again, she's a new affiliate on there, so that's awesome. Uh, her podcasts are Screen Snark and the Infinity Podcast. And yeah, since I'm trying to get people to buy Sounds of Breadsheet at hossbossman.bandcamp.com, that's 29 tracks for $7, here's a classic Breadsheet song from that brand new album. Ladies and gents, listen as we ride out on Jordan Holmes' original Breadsheet theme, featuring the king of right-wing conspiracy weirdos himself, Mr. Alex Jones. But more importantly... Mr. Jordan Holmes of the Knowledge Vibe Podcast. Bye, love ya, and see you in one week for part two, or see you in a few days, probably, for part two of Ms. Rachel Quirky Shank's part two interview. Bye, love you. He was a totally satanic demon by age 10, reportedly. Rep- oh, who? What? Why? Go to bed. You let that guy babysit your kids. I mean, look at that. That is not a human. Why? Go to bed. He just looks like a guy. And it's not a mean thing to say that about him. Go to bed. But he doesn't have a soul. And nobody puts that in books. I'm just telling you that's what I'm saying. Go to bed. DM. What's your price spot today? DM. I'm Jordan. We're a couple dudes. Go to bed. Mic down for this. This is stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Go to bed. It's really my speed of stupid, though. <laughs> Reportedly. What's your price spot today? 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 Who wins in a fight, the devil or a Kennedy? <laughs> if you like this, that will blow my mind.